but uh, Patrick Dubois uh, did the first uh, DevOps days in Ghent, Belgium back in 2009. Uh, he uh, has been a uh, you know, super uh, key and important part of getting DevOps off the ground. Uh, we uh, were proud to have him as a, a friend here in Austin. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a quick story about how I met him. So uh, I went to uh, Velocity Conference out in, uh, out in San Francisco, uh, and it was Peco and I, and we were there, and the rental car company uh, was like, we're out of cars. Here, have a minivan. And we're like, okay, fine. Uh, and so in an, in an attempt to escape the uh, horrid hotel food uh, that they have there, uh, we're like, okay, well, let's go, out, let's go out and get some food. And we're like, we have a minivan so we just kind of walked to the lobby and we're like hey burrito run who wants to go and a couple people wandered up and we're like i want food we're like all right come on i love burritos <clears throat> uh and we drive to you know your standard silicon valley you know weird little restaurant in an industrial office park sort of thing right uh, and uh and you know this is right you know right after kind of DevOps was a, started to be a thing, and so everybody's always talking about it. And so, you know, we're sitting there eating, and and uh, uh, you know, people are like, "Well, what what is this DevOps thing?" You know, and I, I or you may have prompted that somehow. And so, you know, I sit there, I'm like, "Well, I think DevOps is blah 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 blah, right?" And uh, and he's like, "Oh, well, when I coined the term, I kind of thought whatever." And I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> 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 like I just got burned. Uh, so uh, uh, Patrick's a, a great guy, uh, uh, and he's uh, come out here to Austin. I don't know how many DevOps days has he been there. Three uh, times now. Three times, uh, and uh, he's a great guy. And we wanted to get uh, some words for him. It's the tenth anniversary uh, of that DevOps days in Ghent this year. Mm -hmm. uh, so DevOps days is, is uh, almost ten years old uh, right now, and so we thought we'd have him. Yeah. So we thought we'd uh, have him come out here, uh, reflect on uh, reflect on what's going on, what uh, he sees in the future, and uh, <laughs> and all that good sort of thing. So uh, with that, we hand it over to Patrick Dubois. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. So I uh, I think yesterday I tweeted there's two questions you can't ask me. What do you think about Kubernetes, and what's the future of DevOps? So don't please don't ask me that. Um, okay, just. So, like Ernest says, this is kind of a reflection. It's not like the reflection um, about over 10 years. Um, like I moved on as well over the years, so it's probably part of like part of my story, my learnings that I'll mix in and, and see how that goes from there. Uh, but obviously, there's a relation to Dev and Ops uh, uh, doing that together. Um, so th the first part is a little bit like. Yeah, we, we, like DevOps was uh, the collaboration between Dev and Ops, uh, you know, I don't have to explain that, but like th this part of the DevOps pipeline got like so important in the whole uh, thing. It, so th the pipeline drew like all the attention somehow. So even though we're like nice people on the beach and doing stuff, like it's the pipeline that draws the attention. And, and even though like, it's like putting water in the sea, but you know it's the pipeline that's the most important. And um, it's it has been strange to see that this has been getting so much focus. Like obviously it's part of the delivery, but that tech pipeline was kind of like uh, something I didn't really foresee uh, to have drawn all the uh, attention there. Um, Obviously, we, we wanted to focus more on the cultural side and the collaboration side. Um, I think the message got true, but once in a while, no, no, I stopped looking at the hashtag DevOps on Twitter because you know it makes me sick. You know, people using it, but you know, occasionally I will look, and then yeah, there's some part of the culture, and then it's just like slap it on on whatever technology you have, and like we call it DevOps. And part of that, I think, is that um, even though you know. We had the word CAMs, like culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. The automation has been like a double-edged sword in the whole thing. Um, so if you look back at things like ITIL, uh, you know, 
I met some of the early folks and read the books, and, and they were all about like, okay, good intentions, good like practices, and kind of make that. And then <laughs> somehow ITIL get related to the control tools, like the help desk, the ticketing system, like making it rigid, making it controlled. It might have been a manifestation of the zeitgeist from that time, but um, like part of the popularity was having a technology change uh, being brought in in the company. The same has actually happened with Agile. Like Agile was uh, like all about like working together, fast feedback and so on, but it was TDD that got the attention <laughs> of the tech people kind of like making the tests. And, and so it seems like any of the <laughs> changes or the movements or whatever you want to call it, there's this schizophrenic relation between like cultural change and the technology as like a, a Trojan horse that's, you know, that helps spreading the message, but in the end it starts like overtaking it. So it's kind of a, you know, double-edged sword. Um, the other thing I, I kind of learned, um, which, you know, I'm not that t type of guy, but the bitching going on between I use tool A and I use tool B and we're like against each other, like, no, you shouldn't be talking about DevOps anymore. It's SRE now. No, it's not containers. It's serverless. Like, I don't know. It's, it feels like, like I have three kids and that's how they would think. Like, yeah, this is the, the flavor of the jour. And if you can't put things in pr perspective, of you know, where we came from, why this was useful, what's the use case, and, and this, that. And I thought like this was kind of going away, but you know, serverless proved it again and again. This is happening. The old is new and kind of, and, and sometimes it's almost like, I don't know, this is something inherent in the human, like the Neanderthaler trying to repress the wives. And I don't know, it's kind of, it's, it's this macho behavior like, we're the best, we're like innovative, we're the new ones, and then without any learning from the past, and it, it just makes me, me sad uh, to work on that. Like no more testers, no more architects. Come on, this is, this is just like childish stuff uh, that we do. Um, I think me personally, you no, know, having done uh, a lot of the stuff in the you know, automation and uh, the pipeline and so on. I, I do feel uh, that, you know, in my own company, like security is uh, like adding to that. So I, I do understand the trend of DevSecOps uh, going there, but um, I also just like the pipeline and the automation want to say that it's, you know, people who know me, they would say like, just enough security, right? You, you don't, make your house a blind house, you know, you have to live in it. There's things you will have to do. And it's not by buying all the tools and like making you like the super secure Ford, uh, just like just enough. And, and obviously, you know, from a marketing perspective, people will try to like say, you know, we're gonna help you, we're gonna automate that stuff and we're gonna go through, but this kind of, you know, keep it in balance. That's, I guess, uh, what I, uh, I was trying to say. And so the first five years of DevOps, I was kind of like doing IT consultancy integration work. So I, you know, over the years I've taken the habit of doing multiple roles, like being a tester, a dev, an ops manager, you know, a project manager. And that like really learned, made me learn the different groups. Like I came into a company and was, you know, the dev guy and I didn't, they, they didn't trust me because, you know, I was just entered the company through the dev while I've been doing ops for a long time and this kind of feeling where whatever you enter, there's like you're in the other group. Okay, obviously DevOps kind of made it a little bit easier. Uh, but I think what I've learned for the, the last five years, um, and I took that deliberate role, like, you know, I joined a startup and I thought like I had done the other roles, but I've never lived running a business. Like, okay, I, I, I thought like, I'm good. I know some DevOps, I can automate that, it's all good. And 
no, we're going to have a great company and let's go for that. So, so part of what follows now is more like what I've learned of running the business and not kind of being the perspective of just being DevOps there. Um, so the first thing that I learned running my company is that like, uh, we uh, hired somebody from marketing, and this is typically the, the, you know, the view people have on our marketing. They will promise you the moon, right? Uh, like, we can do anything with our tooling and like the biggest company and so on. Um, and it turns out they, uh, as a group, they feel really disconnected from the other part of the company. They feel like nobody gets us, like we're doing good work, uh, similar to how Ops felt. <laughs> like, hey, we're doing this really great stuff. And I cannot stress it enough, like how important job they do. They reach out, they make sure your message is heard and do all the stuff. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to all the DevRel guys because, you know, that's marketing, relationship, and, and making sure uh, people get the feedback and make sure that your message is out there. And, and they're so important in, in the stuff. So, but you think like, okay, they're like in very similar, like in a, in a group, nobody like seems to understand that they have their own ways and go from there. But when, when that person said it, her pipeline on marketing up, I was kind of like, what? You have a pipeline? So I'll tell you how it goes. Like you put it, something on the website, there's a tracker in there. They will see in their system, did you come by? They send you an email automatically if you uh, came by. If you came again, they will see whatever page you visited. They can kind of target you. They follow it up by saying, you haven't been here for a week, so what happened? So they have this kind of, they kind of suck your attention <laughs> inside the pipeline just as your code would go inside the pipeline. And I find that fascinating, like how much she automated of the whole process, you know, very similar to what we did on the automation pipeline. And then, so marketing got the attention. The next phase is, you know, you got the attention, you kind of have to sell it uh, to them. And you know, the picture says stereotype, like the fancy cars with the big exhaust and kind of like, hey, we're, but hey, if they don't sell stuff, <laughs> you don't get paid. <laughs> well, at least uh, unless you have like funding or whatever, but you know, that's how you make the money. And obviously they have to understand uh, what you're doing, how to sell it, and the message they are kind of putting across has to kind of be in balance there. And uh, it could be subtle things, like um, just by chatting to them, they had like a build up a pricing model, and um, it says like, okay, we're gonna give you a discount uh, when you have volumes. And part of our, you know, our offering, because it's linearly scaling, there is no economies of scale there. It's linearly scaling, because you know, in our case, the capacity needs to be there, and it's 10 capacity, it's 20 capacity, and, and 30 capacity, and you know, they would like easily put like, hey, just give them a discount. So, you know, there's other ways of giving discounts for for whatever we did, but so it's it's uh, stuff we learned. Uh, they were super stressing us for feedback. Feedback. We want to have a trial system. We want to have it in front of the customers as fast as we can, because then we can show it. We want to have a demo system. All the new features, can we show them to the customers? So they were trying to pull that in uh, as well, like because in their sales funnel, getting somebody through, this is kind of the same model. And uh, there, my surprise was, when you start reading about sales, you will not believe me how many frameworks exist. <laughs> So they're suffering from the same thing. Like everybody invented their own sales framework, uh, like with their own name and you have to pick it. And the next day, it's gonna be a new framework you wanna go to. So sounded like really similar um, to that. And then my best friends, legal. You know, um, you don't know how to appreciate it until you hit like a problem. And, you know, doesn't that sound familiar with ops? <laughs> yeah. 
you know, they put like a really good stress on our uh, infrastructure, architecture, like you could loathe at GDPR, but I think it actually like made us build like a better uh, architecture uh, to put things on. And obviously, you know, all the compliance system and so on, and also signing contracts, getting feedback, they automated all that stuff. Like, okay, send you a link, do your changes, and so on. So, so you know, respect for them. They might not always talk our language, but that's why sitting with them together is so important because, you know, uh, <laughs> they will, you know, the default contracts sometimes uh, make you think that you have to deliver Fort Knox or something. Uh, but, you know, if you start talking to them like, okay, but that's acceptable if you put it in and, and kind of uh, go from there uh, to do that. You know, overall management. I learned that it is actually, part of it is just making sure there's no back pressure between all the pipelines. <laughs> Just making sure they're all connected, like like one is not overselling, and then you don't have people to deliver, and and kind of striking that balance, and also going outside, like watch the competitors, like do the navigation, like what's happening over there, and and that's uh, and even with suppliers, like you, we would think like we're more, um, using increasingly more services, and you have to think of them as suppliers, so you have to create a relationship for people supplying tech to you and kind of talk to them as well. Um, it's, it's not that I'm like, this is not rocket science, but it's just like the understanding that every part is, is a similar, similar, uh, similar uh, problem. And then HR, you know, these are the people who make sure that your paycheck is there. <laughs> like, they're doing really important jobs. So if they do it also right, they will make sure that with your help, they hire the right people. Like with the interviews, the way they set it up, like the job advertising, this is just feedback from you and them and kind of making sure you, you kind of uh, make the nice, uh, get the nice people you want. Um, and again, that was another surprise for me on the automation side for them. Uh, I found out there was like, like websites where you can say like, okay, I put my job advertising, you can apply for a job, do a recording, there's uh, automatically like a hangout scheduling, uh, like they record it, they give the feedback from both sides, uh, make the notes, you can rewatch it in your company. You know, you know, automation is happening there too. I'm, I'm not talking about the Amazon automatically firing people <laughs> based on their coda, but you know, there's a lot of, uh, things that, you know, putting things on LinkedIn, searching people, putting it out there. There's, that's like almost like search engine optimization for a website, but this is for getting the people that you want to have. And it's like an important job if you are growing because hiring talent is really hard and they take like a good like chunk of work to, to make sure that this is happening to you. And then there's finance. Um, if you're a young startup, you want to watch the cash flow. And these are the guys who will tell you, like, ha, you can't spend the money right now. But, you know, I really want it. Maybe later, you know, sell two more contracts, and then we will see what happens. Uh, and um, there are also the people who will warrant you from a f real failure. Like, you can, like, buy services and go there. It's like, oh, we need this, we need that. Like, but, yeah. So there are like this kind of capping or stress factor that you have to take into account. Like whatever you spend, whatever you do, that is like, you know, the incomes match the outgoing money. And that's their super important role where, you know, as an idealist in tech, you say, well, I need this and this be cool and this be cool. but you're not responsible and you don't see the, you know, the, in, the money coming in and that's part of where uh, they connect you. And maybe the last one on the chain is like the customer service. It's not specifically ops, but you know, all the quirks your product has, they, you know, they talk to the people, they give you like awesome feedback. Uh, obviously, they must be very good at communicating because, you know, People want to be helped, they want to get like, 
a good feeling. Uh, like one thing that really worked for us is that uh, we had somebody who started off as a designer and later become, became a tester and is now in customer service. But she often, like when there's new features, she sees the whole cycle. So she's, she's there when the feature is designed she knows what to test because she know she was in like in the discussion of the feature what it should have been, and then she gets the feedback in customer servers whether it's actually working for the people. So that was a really good uh, uh, learning, you know, to to have those different roles and have somebody shift between those different roles just because it like, you know, uh, it's less throwing over the wall like I make a design and it's done. No, no, you will be there also to make sure. Uh, for supporting the people. And I guess that brings me to like, just, you know, if, if you think, you know, the, somewhere a pipeline, but there's so many pipelines and kind of things that you need to have like in order to make them run. They're in a way, if they're, they're all wanna be like, if they all wanna be performant, in some weird way they do some cams and they're like focus on that as well. And you will probably need all of them to succeed. It's not like we build it, they will come. So, you know, we all know that myth. And it also shows you that when you have the argument, you know, am I dev and am I ops? But if you extend that, am I HR, am I sales, am I marketing? It's not about having one person to all the roles. It's being able to understand all the roles, to have empathy for all the different roles and, and making them work together. Um, and <laughs> you have to think of that. They have, all the other departments have actually been serverless for years, and they've done their job as well, so <laughs> don't worry about that. So that was my kind of like learnings over the inside. It seems trivial in a way, but you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, expand that uh, to make the business. Uh, so that's my talk. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, great, uh, great points. Like we, uh, we frequently get, uh, uh, yeah, we we talk about kind of the bigger picture of of DevOps and collaboration, but it's very easy to still still get siloed. And if it's not, you know, we're the DevOps team. You know, it's it's engineering is siloed, whatnot, and uh, the ability to uh, kind of really work uh, well with all these other parts of the business who are facing uh, the same sorts of challenges uh, that, that we are is uh, uh, super important. So thanks for sharing that with us. So if you have any questions? Or oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Questions. You can catch me later if you want Ask to. Ask me. Fine. Okay. So how would you expect a DevOps team can I use that phrase? Uh, to have visibility into those other elements, right? I mean, what do you expect the, the touch points might be so we can get better appreciation for what their roles are so we can better understand what the requirements are? So, yeah, I, di I think the, um, the visibility comes often from, um, like, maybe you could do, like, a, a weekly sharing where it's not just a demo of your team, but you, you show, like, uh, what's happening in the other departments and, hey, you did a good job at hiring. Hey, our cash flow is low. So, because people tend to think that there is, like, you know, these people, these meetings don't mix, right? And uh, I think that that's partly, that's one way you could expect the other to do it, but you can also start asking about it. Hey, how do we do our hiring here? Like, can I help somewhere? Uh, how do we do, like, uh, how are we doing on finances and kind of like what's, like, what are we burning here compared to what we're delivering? Is there any, like, internal measure you're using that's useful for us to kind of work against it? So it's, it's, it's not only passively, like, getting the info, but you could reach out. Uh, I understand sometimes it's not given in companies because, you know, they kind of keep the silos away from each other. <laughs> but... Um, um, one, one thing I learned is that you might build something, you know, 
without bugs and get it to production and so on, but if, if you can't sell it, and it's, it's like something you need to be aware of. Like, um, and for example, one thing I've experienced personally is that we were like in the engineering team and getting a lot of stress, like, you know, we're, we're only three, four people having to like wield all that stuff. And then I realized the problem is not us. The problem is we might not have a market fit that it doesn't sell enough. And then you start asking like, but what feature do we need to build? And you go to sales and you start asking like, what do you think, like what resonates with the people? And you start thinking about those experiments. Uh, I don't know if that's answered your question. Yeah? Sure. So, so Patrick, I just wanted to follow up on kind of what you said. So as you guys are building stuff, um, you know, how do you connect with a business? You connect with a business through your customers. So it's empathy. It's understanding not necessarily what sales and marketing tell you. Always find a way to connect to what actually your customers are needing and doing. So it's, a, it's a, just, just kind of follow up on Patrick's thing. Yeah. It's, it's not a getting bombarded with metrics and tossing things over the wall. So the most relatable way is like, OK, we're working on this project. Who are the customers? What are they doing? Can we actually point to specific people and name them they're going to use this feature of this product and this capability. So you as an engineer, you may think like, oh, I don't need to worry about it. There's other people. But you should worry about it. What you do impacts these people. It's not just the business. It's not just marketing. It's not just sales. Mm -hmm. right, so it's, it's inject empathy in your work, and you're going to see great results. I, I just want to add to that is that I learned that I know this is what people always say. like. Build something your customers like, yes? But if you have a business uh, reality, you might have people who like your product, but building it is not economically feasible because they have to pay a high fee and they might not be willing to ask for it. They, they might like your product if they get it for free. Like this is the sweet spot between it being able to sell something uh, or for free or charge you and make sure you can live on that for your business. So it's a little bit different perspective than just saying build something people will like because yes, if you, depending what like economically feasible situation you're in, they might not be willing to pay for it even though they might like it. So uh, it's, it's a different perspective there. James? Yeah, hey, yeah Patrick, this kind of changes gears a little bit but um, DevOps early days, we tried really, really, really hard to say culture, 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 right? And then now we've jacked that up. Uh, now security is like DevSecOps and like they're kind of coming to the party. Is there any hope that we don't uh, cross the same problem with them as well? Do you, do, you have any, do you have any recommendations on like, what, 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 what can we do different? Because we basically have a whole new uh, you know, group of people that are kind of coming into DevOps mm -hmm. fresh. How do we somehow, is there, is there any hope that we can somehow say it's not the tooling and the automation, but that it is the culture or? Well, it, it's not that I don't have any hope, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's um, I think at the moment, um, I don't know. It's, it's something I think about, like we keep going the same treadmill over and over again and making that own mistake, in my opinion. Um, and I don't know, it's, uh, you know, it's probably. I, I don't know what you should have done differently. No, 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 no. Yeah. But, it, but it's, it's almost like uh, the other day I called it on Twitter, I called it like tech gravity. Like when you, like when you talk about culture somehow, tech pulls you right back into mm. the tech talk. It's, it's, I, I don't know what's, what that could be like. Uh, maybe when they f make us feel less of a rock star or something, we, we kind of uh, start thinking more about like, hey, uh, I, I, I'd like to collaborate with you, be friendly with you, and, and, and less about like, we're gonna sit in a corner. It might be our DNA that we've done for so many years, like, hey, the engineer somewhere in the corner, and the nerd somewhere in the corner, and like, like we'll do our stuff, and. We're like uh, people shy, but I don't know. It's uh, I, I think there's you know there has been changes, or at least it has surfaced a lot more that people are you know willing to collaborate and being more friendly to each other on that level. 
but the gravity is so strong. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but let's keep hope, like the eternal hope, like the Star Wars hope, like <laughs> that will survive the stormtroopers. <laughs> okay. Other questions? All right. Actually, Thank you very much. I, I have one. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> since no one else does. Go ahead. Cardi. So, um, you know the. The idea of people working together um, is really easy to implement in a startup setting, like where you can just go talk to the CEO and have a you know, candid conversation uh, about whatever, right? But what are some learnings or what are some ways to do that in like larger enterprise um, where you, know, you go talk to HR folks about uh, practices and stuff like that? The, the, wh when you say that like the larger you know, when you make the drawing and say, the organization gets bitter, bigger, so there's more communication, so I need more time for the communication to spread out, and I, you know, I need that, you will get the pressure on, uh, we need, uh, you know, if you're not doing stuff, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not uh, productive. And I, I think that's the tendency I try to change there, is that communication is part of, being productive uh, there, and um, and that's the only way. If you get get the time to communicate, and it's part of your job, then I think it will change. And otherwise, it, it's just going to be your spare time, and you're mixing it in kind of somehow. Uh, unless there's a clear, you know, business pressure, this needs to go out. You know, like the war room we had, but kind of like that. You use that as a the first step to like, hey collaboration step to go there, so, okay. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, 